Hello? Hello? Oh, God. Hello? We can hear you. Thanks, Ms. Ordway. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Just make sure you put yourself on mute when you're, uh, when you're not speaking. Thank you. Yes. We'll start in a couple minutes. Oh, okay. We haven't started yet? Awesome. I just wanted to make sure. All right. So I'll mute myself until you tell me we're ready. Good evening and welcome to the governing board meeting for the Deer Valley Unified School District on Tuesday, November 14, 2023. I call the order to meet at 7.05. Let the record reflect that all board members are present except Mr. Carver. He'll be here uh, late. If you are able to stand, please do so and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance and of the United States of America, to the court, to one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Can I have a motion to adopt the agenda? I would like to make a motion to adopt the agenda, moving discussion items A, B, and C to directly follow 7C. Which item? She wants to move a discussion item. Uh, which? Uh, we don't have a second. I uh, do have, uh, Mrs. Orway, can you please repeat again? Um, I would like to um, move the discussion items A, B, and C to directly follow 7C. The um, content of the meeting up until then should move quickly and the discussion item could be in its natural place. We don't have a second, so we'll move forward.
Can I get I a move the okay. board adopt the agenda as presented? Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt the agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, please say nay. Aye. aye. Mrs. Orway, uh, uh, what's your vote? Mm -hmm. Okay. We have three. Motion passes. Motion passes. We're going to move on to ac action item number three. Call to the public. Mrs. Fisher, can you please read the uh, admonishment and call the speakers? Okay. We have uh, nine speakers, so I'm going to kind of call the first half and then I'll admonish while you're on your way up. Uh, the first one is Tim Stroh. Second is Kendra Ament. Third is Joshua Hawkins. Uh, fourth is Tiffany Hawkins. The board invites public comments on the district's business in general and on any agenda item in specific. All speakers must observe the rules of decorum. Speakers must fill out a card listing the name, address, and topic that handed to the board secretary prior to the president calling the meeting to order. Speakers must make their comments in no more than three minutes. If necessary, to accommodate all speakers with 30 minutes. Overall limit, the board's president may shorten each speaker's time. Constructive criticism is in order. Rudeness, vulgarity, disruptive conduct, remarks disparaging personal dignity are not in order and will not be allowed. Under Arizona open meeting laws, the governing board cannot discuss or act on any items not listed on the agenda. Board members may respond to criticism made by a speaker, ask the staff to review a matter, or ask that a matter be put on a future agenda. So if you go ahead and speak, uh, step up to the uh, microphone, state your name for the record, and uh, begin your uh, public comment. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tim Stroh. Um, thank you for the time to speak tonight. Um, I'm here tonight to raise awareness and to encourage change in the enforcement of Deer Valley School District athletic policies. My daughter attended Deer Valley High School last year and had an IEP. She was discriminated against by two coaches and the Deer Valley High School athletic director. I went through the appropriate process and raised my concerns with school staff regarding my daughter's case and how district athletic policies were not enforced and the school refused to budge. However, after finally meeting with the district athletic director, he immediately agreed with the evidence and sided with my daughter. The problem is that district staff agreed with my daughter's case, but the school staff still refuses to address the problem. This is unacceptable to my daughter and to kids currently attending Deer Valley High School. District athletic policies need to be enforced and unprofessional behavior by coaches needs to be addressed. I truly um, understand the challenges that teachers and coaches face on a daily basis. I'm extremely grateful for all that they do, but coaching student athletes is a privilege that comes with great responsibility and coaches need to be accountable for their actions. I have been patient and worked through the process over the past several months to resolve this issue. We have contacted the Arizona Center for Disability Law, Arizona Department of Education Exceptional Student Services. We have filed complaints with the Arizona State Board of Education and the Office of Civil Rights. Tonight, I've left each one of you a packet to review and to hopefully and potentially take action on this. Thank you very much for your time. Go ahead and step up to state your name for the record. Kendra Ament. Good evening, President Paperman and board members. I come to you tonight as a concerned parent and worried of what's to come. Many troublesome issues have crawled their way to the surface. Bullying harassment policies are out of alignment with the law. Unwritten rules contradict themselves. Basic safety training that has been patched together. Students openly defying, defying MTSSB guidelines, physical fighting, drugs, wet, and weapons on campus. District staff ignoring or not knowing policy and reporting parents' concerns about school staff failing to document assault, student disorderly conduct, along with cyberbullying and harassment. Among these issues, the most concerning is several staff members have been allowed to resign instead of terminated and allowed to continue working in the district without notification to the community. 
when they have documented sexual misconduct with students and abu or abuse. Why is this being allowed? I had my fair share of discrepancies with, this with the district, but this is outrageous. I pride myself on the way I raise my children. With honesty, integrity, and respect, they have always understood their consequences for poor choices. In the years I have been in this district, I have seen how far, how fall, far we've fallen expecting accountability, holding students responsible for their actions and their words, keeping staff up to date and pre on prevention and proper training, having a plan for anything that may come. Lately, this district seems unprepared for the issues that are in front of them today. No more excuses. This must change. I want to actually thank, thank the Hawkins family for bringing light to many issues we face as a district. The constant lack of open communication and consideration of the students and families affected by poor leadership will lead to further contempt. They have brought attention to a significant mismanagement in policy and training. I respect their strength and determination in bringing factual information to the public's attention and making information available to achieve responsible and needed changes in policy. I also believe an apology is owed to the Hawkins family for the unprofessional and stunning disrespect Superintendent Fitch and Assistant Super Z showed towards the concerns while calling them liars, interrupting their public speaking time during a board meeting. We expect more from a superintendent and our school leadership. The work the Hawkins family have done to bring facts forward have reached the community and parents are realizing the district's policies are not unified and the schools are made to administer rules at whim. Parents are asking questions and seeking answers. You can't ignore these concerns forever. Eventually, you'll end up with an avoidable mess that's too late to make right. Do the right thing and make the necessary changes and hold the district admin responsible for their failure in providing unified direction and follow through with policies they put in place. You, the board members, were elected to be the oversight, to be the voice for students and parents, and to find resolutions to issues the community brings forward. We, the community, expect you to stop the petty excuse me, stop the pettiness of differing personalities, do your job by coming prepared and attentive to the board meetings, work to find quick solutions to concerns and publicly address all resolutions so the public is aware issues aren't going unnoticed. Too many times have, too many, excuse me, too many issues have been swept under the rug, only come back with a vengeance because action is not taken. The students, parents, teachers, and the community expect better. You need to do better. Step to the microphone, state your name for the record. Joshua Hawkins. Good evening, board. I'd like to take you back to a time when things made more sense, when this district seemed to have things in order. 2018 was a big year. May 8, 2018, special session. Jim Migliorino has asked how the district is going to fulfill its obligations towards instructional time during the Red for Red movement. Per Jim, the state statute, and I quote, has an or in it requiring 180 days or hours. Since you were going to be missing the days, you were able to still meet the requirement with instructional hours. One or the other would suffice. On November 12, 2019, Ms. Moffitt is advising that additional supports the district offered for mental health for the staff. Ms. Moffitt is referring to the supports and efforts to promote. She says, we know that if we put something out there, just tell people it's there, never touch it again, and never tell them how to utilize it or how it'll benefit them, it will never be used. While Mr. Bigley Reno has a firm grasp on OR, the rest of the district is still struggling to process OR on their JICK policy or how to interpret the prongs of bullying and harassment. Even their internal administrative management guidelines on this policy only restate the policy's words and doesn't provide any further clarity. The AMG in question hasn't even been revised since 2016, long before Dr. Finch came on board. And yet, seven years after its last revision, we are still following the same failed guideline. This AMG clearly states that both aggressor and victim are to have documentation, yet everyone in the ALS team has confirmed they typically only document the aggressor. How shameful that this district neglects the victims and protects the bullies. As Ms. Moffitt had hit the head in 2019 that if you fail to return to your instructions, you fail to learn the lesson. If you never touch it again, you will forget about it. The state of Arizona put into law in writing in 2011 ARS 15-341 that states all alleged bullying and harassment cases are to be documented. In ARS 13-2921, legal definition of harassment, nowhere does it say it must be first repetitive to be documented. Nowhere in either law does it state that you first pass judgment on actions before you investigate and document. Alleged means trust first, but verify through investigation. Even if you update policies and practices now, even if everything changed, how can we trust you will follow through? Over the last six years, you've failed to notice the inaccurate policies or out-of-date practices. As per ALS manager Tony, we wouldn't even be aware unless you brought it to our attention. Our district is too big and the admins would live here learning to try all the policies and laws. Six years is more than enough time. Did you follow Ms. Moffitt's advice from 2019? Did you look at the policy again, explain how to utilize it, how it will benefit them, or was it never used again? 
So what tangible impact can be seen from 2018 when the JICK policy was updated till today? Please state your name for the record. Um, and then your three minutes will begin. Tiffany Hawking. Good evening, board. Our government writes the laws, our policies must follow the law, and our practice must follow the policies, which then follow the law. So your practice should follow the law. Per practice, harassment must be done three to four times as a classroom behavior action before it becomes a major infraction and sent to the office for their first major consequence. This district refers to the discipline matrix as listing all major conduct, but harassment can be done several times before it makes it to the matrix for discipline. And further after that, the minimum consequence is a conference, a talking to. Not to mention, you may only document the aggressor in SIS and likely not the victim at all. While your AMG states that both parties are to receive documentation on their records, in addition to reporting it in the Office of Civil Rights reporting sheet. So are some of these cases that are missing documentation in power schools also missing from the civil rights reports? From missing reporting forms and missing safety trainings to fistfights in the halls, this district is missing some massive oversight. As Ms. Moffitt explained, that if you never come back to it again or touch it, you will never use it. Our practices are not in line with the law because you never came back to it. Documentation is being forgotten because this district hasn't clearly explained the benefits and how to utilize it. I see the ALS team visiting all the campuses and social media. Seems like a great opportunity to perform an audit at all the school's records. As ALS manager Tony stated, this district wouldn't even be aware of their policy, documentation, and practice issues if we didn't bring it to their attention. This is where an oversight committee should be formed. A team that simply visits campuses to verify compliance of policies and laws. A team that checks records and documentation requirements. Tony verified that no one goes back and reviews the discipline codes after they have been entered into Panorama. With ambiguous policies, inconsistent documentation, lack of training, and no oversight of data being entered, how many of these are being incorrectly reported as one behavior instead of another, or not at all? Mind you, the superintendent's bonus is tied directly to this data being reported. But these are all the ideas that the district should be working on themselves and not relying on the parents to tell them when they're wrong. I'm not getting paid to do your job and review your policies in action. Even if a concerned parent comes forward with a legitimate issue, it takes months of waiting, months in person meetings, emails, board meetings, follow ups, and anything else that can be used to silence us. As ALS director stated, sometimes you have to have faith in the bosses of the ones that you feel are breaking the law. While I understand what he meant, it is difficult to trust that when the director also says, I understand how it is difficult, especially for a parent when it's not in the language. It is difficult to practice. As Ms. Moffitt said, if we put something out there, just tell people it's there and we never touch it again and never tell them how to utilize it or how it'll benefit them, it will never be used. It is time to look at everything again, stop breaking the law and make changes to save these children. Okay, the next group, uh, Kim Merrow, Michelle Cole, Judy uh, Dallas, Karen, uh, Jerry Knorr, and Stacy Brocious. Thank you. They're mixed up now, sorry. Put the first speaker in your slide step to the microphone, state your name for the record. Um, and then you can begin. Kim Merrow. My name is Kim Merrow and I'm a parent of two students in the district. I had the pleasure this summer to be a part of the process of adopting a new mathematics resource for the district in K through five. The process was very interesting and I met some amazing teachers as well as other parents and people from the community. I learned this is a very hard process and we have in the district a lot of great teachers who are interested in making sure our kids have the best learning experience. I personally preferred iReady Classroom, and here's why. It has a very good digital and paper content, so for students who need the digital stimulation, they have that. The resources for parents were great and very easy to use. They had online games that was included in the cost, and the kids can play against the computer or their classmates. As the students play, it gets to know the students, where the student is educationally and gives them related content. A great bonus is data. In most places, most businesses, we rely on data. And the fact that the data from the previous year's student's growth travels to the next year's teacher is excellent. In addition to that, if a new student joins the district and comes from another iReady district, that teacher will have access to their learning data. Last, when presented to us, 
they said that if our content or our contract with them and the district felt the kids were not learning to Arizona standards, we could request a refund. There was not a single other company that offered that. Thank you for your time. Same thing, step to this uh, microphone, state your name for the record, and you can begin your three minutes. Michelle Cole. Good evening, members of the governing board, staff, visitors, and listeners. On October 25th, Dr. Dickey came into my classroom from 1245 to 130 to record a lesson. I did not volunteer to have this happen. I was just told the Friday prior that this would be happening. I did believe that this would be a learning opportunity as I am a TPP teacher and Dr. Dickey is portrayed as a master teacher. Dr. Dickey entered my classroom with Dr. Knight, Lisa Crane, and Tony Galetti. I was told to sit in the back of my classroom and observe as Dr. Dickey would be running the lesson. He started by stating the norms as my students started to raise their hands and ask questions. They also started using their hand signals for bathroom water and to get a tissue. They also li listened on my board with these are, these are also listed on my board with pictures. Dr. Dickey states that this is clearly no routine in this classroom. First, he had never spoken with me on what my classroom routine is. During direct instruction, I do not let my students get drinks or go to the bathroom. He starts letting them do this, and he also let a few students get drinks and use the restroom. He stops them and says no more. He later lets them resume going to do this which then he contradicts what he told them and it's not following my routine. Throughout the lesson, he treats my students terrible. I had, I had them sit back, I had to then sit back and just watch while not only did he do this, but the administration and two district employees also did absolutely nothing during this. I felt attacked in my own classroom, not only personally, but professionally. It was humiliating not only for me, but my students. He spoke about the lack of adults in their lives. He also called out one student in my class and the mother in his life. He had no idea about this particular student and what the student's background is. He also called out another student, which is one of my ELL students and autistic, and he also started shaking and was very scared during this. I have also made such positive strides with the students in my classroom, and Dr. Dickey scared him and also started saying bueno to him during this. I felt like I did something. If I did something, I would lose my job, but I sat there and remained professional. Dr. Dickey had Lisa Crane turn off the record, asked him to turn off the recording, and before he did this, he also started saying things to my students and me. He knew exactly what he was doing. He also used the word hell, then covered his mouth and said, oh, I'm not supposed to say that. Um, what I walked my kids to specials, and then, also, then after that, I went into my first grade classroom, and I began crying. At this point, I was also almost hyperventilating. The disbelief to me was unimaginable that this actually occurred in my classroom. I have been a in this district for 16 years in some capacity, a para, a volunteer, PTA, now I'm a TPP teacher. It was absolutely humi humiliating what this man did in my classroom. Thank you. Step to the microphone, state your name for the record, and then you have your three Judy Dallas. Good evening, members of the board, staff, visitors, and listeners. I teach kindergarten at Sunrise and have been teaching for 16 years. I am a proud DVEA member, and I am here to show Ms. Cole support. She is a hardworking TPP teacher that goes above and beyond with planning for her students. You may not know that she stays on campus late and makes sure her students have what they need each day. I am relieved that Dr. Dickey will not be returning to our campus again and proud of our principal, Dr. Knight, for standing up for her team. I have heard hashtag extraordinary as our, as our DVUSD motto. That should include employees as well as consultants. Dr. Dickey has harassed staff professionally and sexually and embarrassed students while on campus. IEPs are to be followed by teachers, support staff, and all employees working with students. This does not exclude Dr. Dickey. Dr. Dickey should be making accommodations for IEPs and EL standards. Being familiar with all academic standards, including EL standards, should be a requirement when being hired for this type of work. Hearing of staff, EL students, or, or students on IEPs being brought to the point of tears or embarrassment in front of their peers and supervisor is unacceptable. 
We have worked so hard as a whole community to help each student succeed. This is unprofessional and we will stand up for our students and staff when we know it is wrong. Enough is enough. Please do not let this happen at our other Title I schools or other campuses. Let's be better and strive for a hashtag extraordinary. Thank you for your time. State your name for the record and your three minutes will begin. Jerry Knorr, a good evening board and uh, attendees and paid staff. I want to just uh, bring up the last board meeting. Uh, we went through the board meeting and got to the items on the agenda of bullying. And pr just prior to that, we had one board member go offline leave the meeting. We had a second board member leave the meeting, which abruptly ended the meeting, not allowing us to deal with the bullying, which is apparently a huge problem in the district that's been going on for a long time. That just kind of shows me and the public, I believe, what, how the board sees this issue and that tells the employees uh, to follow lead I'm sorry to see this. It was one of the most disgusting and disrespectful things I've seen in a long time, especially from a leader. I've watched the Hawkins family come in here week after week after week to these board meetings, trying to appeal to your senses of their issues. They've been following along the school policies as best I can see, and they're getting nowhere. If each and every one of your board members have not met with this family personally, I find that to be very sad. And it's obvious that maybe we don't want to fix these issues or deal with them or make them right. I'm very appalled by this. And apparently it's just going to continue. I hope we get to some kind of resolve. I am sent an email to every board member and I'm asking for an apology to this family. They waited very patiently with their kids for this last meeting uh, to be walked out on. I've just never seen anything like it. Uh, one particular board member I know very well, when she had her kids in school, would have been first in line to deal with this bullying issue. Uh, she would have been something to deal with on it, but nothing but silence now. Because I guess what, it's not your kids? They don't belong to you. It's not your job. I'm not sure what the problem is, but it's sorry to see. And I'll just continue alerting the public and the families, and we'll just watch our kids and families leave public school by the droves to private schools where they apparently get things right. So thank you for your time. Um, I just want to make <clears throat> one response because it's um, a response to criticism. Um, I just want to be clear that um, board members may not have met with uh, the Hawkins family at this time. We cannot. Um, for, for certain reasons, in the future we can, um, and, and I will, um, but I do want you to understand that at this time, um, we, we can meet with them in this setting, um, but we, we will meet with them in the future. Okay. Or at least I will. Thank you. Am I allowed um, to comment on a response? You can respond to something specific, yeah. Okay. Um, this also goes along with clarifying my vote for this evening. I do believe that the topics up for discussion um, are extremely important, the ones that are on the agenda tonight, and I want to clarify that I left the last session not because I don't care about students and not because I don't care about teachers, but I left to end the discussion that was completely off track. I had mentioned a couple of times to the board during the study session that we were off topic with no response. We can have productive discussions without taking hours to do so. When we get off track, we are no longer helping our students and teachers. We are becoming selfish and hijacking the conversation for personal interests. Tonight, I ask that we be respectful of each other's time and stick to the topic and have productive discussions. Go ahead and step to the microphone, state your name for the record. Stacy Brocious. 
Good evening, board members, Deer Valley colleagues, and community. My name is Stacy Brocious. I am a proud parent of two Deer Valley students currently. One has already graduated. I am an educator in Deer Valley, and I'm currently the vice president of the Deer Valley Education Association. Um, I've come to speak about something that is completely disappointing, and that would be our bond and override not passing. Um, I have to say that when I got the results, I got it pretty emotional. I think that this um, community not showing um, that education and our schools is a priority by either their lack of voting or voting no is devastating. And that's not just for teachers, that's actually for our students. I want my children to go through Deer Valley with everything that they need and I worry about what's going on in our future. More importantly though, I'm very disappointed by the employees in the district that didn't do much to help make the effort to get those votes to pass. With the size of our employee base, our voices should have been loud enough to overshadow the fake facts that were being shared within our district boundaries. Deer Valley Education Association pulled together a group of dedicated supporters that included educators as well as some uh, members of our community who knocked on hundreds of doors wrote hundreds of postcards and shared real facts about what our district would stand to lose without the votes. This was shared on social media. This was shared with conversations with neighbors. This was hours and hours and hours of extra time that these people spent outside of their working teaching time. The support was just not there, obviously. Um, and a small group of dedicated people is not able to get a job of this magnitude done. And we shouldn't have been tasked to make that change for the entire district. We can't make any positive changes without an organized effort. If the district truly wants to see a bond and override pass, which has been in place since 1991, then the district needs to get organized to make that change. And this is all of us within the district. I know and I hope that this is the plan for the next election cycle. And I hope that Deer Valley will come together as a whole to stand up and not give it to just a certain number of people and make sure that all of us are in part, part of making positive change in our district. We are a community that should have come together as one voice, a community that should have made their focus on being hashtag extraordinary and working united. Thank you. Okay, moving on to discussion. Uh, Mrs. Fisher, uh, bullying. Um, well, I'm. I'm a little bit, a um, little concerned the items that we had asked um, be attached to this were not. Um, and I'm a little concerned that um, a board member believes we were off topic. The, the, this topic came forward by a teacher. Um, specifically regarding teacher on teacher bullying, um, student on or teacher on student bullying, bullying regarding um, special education students, and the separation of students. Um, the additional topics of bullying um, in relation to um, the items that have been brought forward um, by the Hawkins family. Um, they're additional to that as well. So to have a productive conversation, I really, I, I guess the first thing we need to do is, um, I do not see Miss Moffitt. Oh, she's in the back. Okay. Um, do we have a specific policy that notes um, bullying on, on bullying teacher on teacher? Or, I mean, is it just the standard um, harassment in the workplace? Or do we have anything that specifically notes bullying or 
Um, any type of things regarding special ed versus gen ed teachers, anything of that nature? We don't have anything like that. Has there ever been anything that's been considered in policy? President Paperman, Ms. Fisher, just as a quick recap to your first question, um, staff ethics would address that. Staff conduct, which I know um, is probably what you're referencing when you said um, our standard policies. We obviously follow statute when it comes to discrimination or um, workplace harassment. They govern that as well. Um, but to answer your question, do we have policies that outline how our special education teachers and with our general education teachers? Um, no, not that specifically, um, but we would follow our, our standard conflict resolution guidelines, and then, of course, if policy was broken, then we would be following due process and looking to see if uh, discipline was warranted. Okay. Um, that being said, because I don't want to recap, but at the last meeting, for those of you who did not attend, I had received a letter from uh, a group of teachers um, specifically regarding bullying um, special education students um, by gen ed teachers or special education teachers by gen ed teachers. I, I don't have a direction to give. I don't have a solution. That's why I'm looking to you to see what we have and is there something that we need to do. And I don't know if there's something that we need a greater topic conversation on that half, on the, on the employee half. Um, I do know that there is also um, staff conduct with students, and that would apply to our, our, our special education teachers being, um, or, or our special education students perhaps not being quite accepted by a general education classroom. Um, that being said, um, and I've always said this, for as long as, as my son has been in this district, and we're talking, what, 20 years? 20, 21 years is when my son's years ago when he started in this district. And I've always said it that not all teachers have to, um, not everybody is intended to have a special education student or a special education student in their life. It's not an easy thing. And sometimes, and we have to be able to give our teachers the ability to say, I can't handle this. We need to have a team or we need to do something because it, it, it is very difficult. Sometimes behaviors appear or feel like you're being attacked when you're not. It's just their behaviors. Um, I've had that conversation with various principals over the years. Um, so for the first half of the bullying, the topic of specifically our teachers, I guess what I'm looking for and the reason I brought it forward for the study session was I was hoping we could have a more constructive, longer conversation. I do think it's going to have to come back as a study session. I think the whole topic's going to have to come back as a study session. But I wanted to make sure that we had direction so that a study session is, it has a purpose. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but I don't have hours to waste if we're not going to come to, to a meaningful conclusion. Um, so I, I would like to see something in that nature is it a training that we need to do and and do we have i hate the word safe spaces i really do but do we have a way for a teacher to honestly say i can't handle this student and it be okay for them because i know that that over the years and the teachers that my son had there were some who could handle him like that he was like king of behavior for them and there were others that just weren't equipped for it and he was like a Tasmanian devil for that poor teacher. And the one teacher that, that he was a Tasmanian devil for, we ended up with a one-on-one -on -one para. Not to protect my son, but to protect everyone from him. And, and so it's, it's important that we're, we're having this. Um, so I'll turn it over to the other board members if they have something to add. But I'm asking that we bring at least that part back as a much greater topic and I would like to see some special education teachers and gen ed teachers who maybe have concerns on what our structure is and what's happening 
um, because I've also heard on the gen ed side, teachers who say that I really can't teach because I have a medically fragile student in my class and I'm not trained to be a nurse. So I've heard, I've heard the spectrum and, and that point is we have to support our teachers or there will be no positive outcomes for special education kids. Um, so that's my take. I'll leave that portion and then we'll go back to the student bullying. Mrs. Orway, do you have any input on this topic? I, I'm trying to figure out if we're on bullying or special ed. Uh, bullying. Or if we're mixing it. Bullying. So we're on bullying of staff on staff right now? Yes, item A discussion. Okay, so well, it's, it's kind of out there. So I'm just wanting to clarify that right now we were talking about bullying referring to staff on staff. Can you? With Mrs. Fisher right now talking about bullying regarding staff on staff bullying. That is correct. That is where we're at. Okay, so if that's something that we want to bring back um, at, a, at another time when we can have a productive conversation in total, I would like to make sure that we would talk about uh, not, we could add special uh, in there too, so we can cover the whole gamut of our certified employees and what might be um, considered bullying or, or whatever we're calling it. Just to clarify, I think what I heard you say, I'm only saying this because I just want, we're having a hard time hearing you. I believe okay, what I heard better? you say is that you want us to bring back um, the administrative process as well, or? I thought I heard you say that you wanted to have uh, this topic brought back because we're probably not going to be able to talk about it productively, and all I was wanting to add is that if we're going to talk about staff on staff, um, mistreatment, bullying, whatever we're going to call it, that we add in all of the staff, and that would include the special teachers. Yeah, I think we're asking for the same thing. Yeah, I think we're asking okay, for the same thing. Okay, yeah, that's thing. what I, I'm, I'm just wanting to add the whole, the whole gamut of uh, teachers and not just leave it at, at uh, gen ed and um, special ed. I think the confusion and what I want to go back and reference about getting off conversation is that we have a discussion here. It says item A, it says bullying. And what happens is that we start talking about something and maybe it has to do with bullying, but then it gets, it's a, it's a bullying and then we have teachers and teachers and then we have um, special education and then we have um, individual students and we need to really just focus on what we're talking about there's no clear agenda of what the discussion item is so at this point it can go in any direction and I just would ask for clarification on if that's what we're going to be talking about if it can be stated so administration at bullying on teachers on teachers or administration that's the topic bullying on special education students, that's a topic. Bullying, um, general education, or just a, an issue that has arose in our community, a topic. So I'm just asking for some clarification on the agenda. So my input on this topic on bullying, I did, uh, during the agenda review, ask Dr. Finch, you know, does the district have a process or policy that they can present? Because from my understanding, I don't know if the board members are on the same page. So from my understanding, what I'm getting from teachers and parents, I believe they know uh, what's the policy for defining bullying, reporting, bullying, investigating, bullying, responding, and recording. Like, how do you record incidents of bullying? So. So I did ask, uh, you know, what, what does the district have in place? And also, how do you train, how do you train the teachers, like, to educate them on the process of bullying? Uh, it seems that 
when I talk to a teacher on this topic, they don't seem to understand, well, uh, well, what are the policies, what are the process? So I think this is something that uh, I think the district needs to, uh, to better educate the staff, to better educate the parents, so they don't have to ask, well, where's the policy? Because they are policy. I looked at other districts uh, that they do have policy, you know, with bullying, like I just stated, reporting, recording incidents. You know, they do have them. So maybe in the future, if the district can provide those to the public and to the staff. Um, are you, any other question? That's, that's part of the second half. So the first one is teachers, and it's, it's how can we get supports for our teachers? Both our gen ed and our special ed teachers What's happening? Is there something happening more widespread than, than what we know, than the letter that came in? And so that's the first half, okay? I think we got that. Now the second half is, um, because we have been hit a lot with bullying lately, um, and uh, it, um, I, I do wanna thank uh, the community for sending, uh, specifically the Hawkins family, for sending in, um, they had sent us in an old board meeting. And I did go back and I did watch it uh, from 2018. Um, and at that time, we had um, um, an advocate parent, um, actually the founder of one of the parent groups, um, and a couple of other parents from up in the area that came here specifically to address the board because of the uh, uptick in suicides at the time, um, and the direct correlation between the suicides and the bullying. Um, and I don't, uh, Ms. Ordway would know, but I don't believe the rest of the board members um, would be aware. But the year prior, we had completely changed our Student Rights and Responsibilities Handbook. There was a lot of issues within it, um, and the board was very involved um, with um, making sure that our Student Rights and Responsibilities Handbook um, was uh, the direction the, of our district. Um, and watching that meeting and watching what occurred in that meeting, um, I did try to give myself a pass and give myself an excuse that I wasn't on the board for the, for the next two years, but I have been on the board back since. Um, and I too dropped the ball. Um, this board, any board, has not adopted the Student Rights and Responsibilities Handbook since 2017. The board hasn't had it. We get it given to us, but we don't have any input, we don't have any say in it, and we don't approve it. So whatever's changed has changed, whatever has it hasn't. And this board, um, so, so that's the second part. Um, because we, again, have had um, several. I, I have personally attended the funerals of several of our young people. Um, and whether it was bullying or another topic, we're still losing students. And we still have students bullying. And, and um, I think what I'm seeing is that our... our our bullying, um, for all of the SEL, I, I, I had someone tell me, oh, well, you're against SEL. No, I'm actually not. It just depends on the SEL. But um, for all of the focus we have had on telling our kids to be nicer, they're not any nicer to each other. And the kids who are not being treated nice they don't know how to handle it any better than the other kids 10 years ago did. Um, something's got to give. Something other than our children. And I would like for us to have the second part of that. We can do the same study session or a different study session. But I think it's about time that the board um, resumes their duty. Um, the board has been pushed to the point of 
your responsibility is to hire a superintendent and support them in whatever they do, and that's it, and adopt a budget. And that's not what the revised statute says. We are responsible for this entire district. If there's a problem with our bullying policies or our bullying processes, it is our duty to be aware of what is happening. And, and the board has been excluded and made unaware. And so I am asking that we also add into that um, a full review of the Student Rights and Responsibilities Handbook a full review of what our process is for the bullying, where the documentation is, the definition of bullying. Because I will tell you that a student who you see physically manhandle or, or woman handle or handle another student or pull hair or what have you, odds are that's not really a bully. That's just a kid that's being squirrely. Because a true bully is getting their digs in silently where you're not looking. And a true victim often will act out and they almost appear to be the bully because they're responding. They're responding to a silent or an unseen torture that they are facing. Um, there are, if you think I'm making it up, I'm not. There are 30 years of peer-reviewed documentation about bullying about the true bullies and what it looks like, and internal bullies within um, uh, systems. You know, I, I, again, have asked that the district read real leaders aren't bullies because there's so much in it, you got to get past the first two chapters. It's the Sandusky uh, situation, and it's real boring for the first two. But then once you get past it, it really gives you an insight to bullying that can be applied to staff, staff on staff, children, but we have to address this. We can't keep losing kids. So I think we need a full documentation in there, a full review of the Student Rights and Responsibilities Handbook, and a full process of what that looks like. Um, and so we, it could be separate or it can be part of the same study session. I would almost prefer separate because I think we need to focus on supporting our teachers in whatever they need. Um, and that may be, I mean, I know that, that we were very mindful to, to add a position to HR specifically for employee relations. Um, you know, Dr. V and I talked a lot about that. And it was, it was very important. But if it's not working, we need to know that. So that's my request. Um, if you guys want any more comments on student bullying, um, I'm sure that. Well, what I think. Okay, so I would like to announce for the record that Mr. Covered uh, joined us at 7.15 p.m. Is he on the phone? He's on the phone, okay. So I just would like to say uh, this topic, bullying, is not the first time that teachers and parents are bringing this. Uh, I don't know how the district can educate the community, parents and staff uh, to provide information, you know, policies, defining bullying, reporting bullying, investigating, recording incidents of bullying. Also, I will, you know, Teachers will also like to know, well, what are the referrals for mental health service as appropriate? Uh, you know, we do uh, have students that I, Mrs. Fisher had mentioned with suicide. Well, what's the process for that? How do we uh, provide those referrals for mental health uh, as appropriate? So maybe something that the district uh, can look into, you know, to educate the public staff, parents, uh, since uh, they're the ones that are asking these questions. And my concerning is more into the classroom. You, we need to very well educate our teachers on you know, providing that information. How do you support, you know, when you see bullying, well, what do you do in the class? Are you trained for that? 
Do you understand the policies? You know, so, so we need to, to me, we need to educate our staff so they have an understanding because I'm getting a lot of teachers that they're asking me, well, what policies are in place for this parts with bullying it? Yeah, so, so if the district, you know, can provide, you know, that training information or a study session or something, you know, to clarify this and to, you know, move forward uh, in a positive way with our district with communication. So, Mrs. Paperman and uh, Mrs. Fisher and Mrs. Simichek and Mr. Carver, would it make sense that we um, wait or, or send some kind of actual structure and framework to the questions we have so when we do have a study session, it is a study session that does not go on in a circular motion for hours, but one that has a scope, a sequence, and an intended uh, exit outcome. And that may be more than one study session. I just think that we seem like we're going all over the place with this. So I do understand what Mrs. Simichek was talking about. The last meeting, we actually, the agenda was out of order, which made the meeting have to end anyway. But going forward, I think that more structure uh, to a study session that does not seem to go on and on forever and have no scope and sequence and exit outcome um, is almost useless. So my ask would be that we send in these topics that we're interested in and make sure that we have that uh, facilitated in a meeting structure that will make sense and people do not have to sit there for four hours listening to personal stories, but we can actually have facts and move forward. <laughs> Ms. Ordway, the Student Rights and Responsibilities Handbook and policy will be our structure. That's what we need to address and review. And beyond well, I, that... I realize that, but what I'm saying is an actual structure to referring and reviewing the student's rights and responsibility and whatever else we're doing, that we need to have an actual structure to Absolutely. those meetings inclusive of what we're using to guide us through. I think that would be extremely helpful um, because we're talking about students' rights and resp responsibility right now, again, but we also brought in a couple of other bullying type issues. So if we can have a structure, I think we're going to have a a conversation that can actually, you know, accomplish what we all want to accomplish, and that's hearing from our community and coming up with solutions. And I believe this is what the community, uh, parents, teachers, this, this is what they're looking for, uh, for answers and structure, if the district can provide and educate them, and that way it will be clarified. Absolutely. We can follow our the exact structure we did in 2015 when we managed to rewrite the entire um, Student Rights and Responsibilities Handbook to be a, a great base for what it is today. And so we can then review um, anything new that's occurred um, and move forward with our responsibility. Okay, so moving on to... Item B, you're doing special education procedures. Special education procedures. Uh, it was not me. That's uh, Mr. Carver. Oh, Mr. Carver. Mr. Carver, are you going to present special education procedures? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I had asked for that to not be added back to the agenda. I appreciated the opportunity to to discuss it, but I will save that for our study session. Thank you for the time, though. Okay, so we're okay, so we're moving item B to special special education procedures to a study session. Okay, item C. Deer Valley Unified School District consulted. Uh, this item was requested by teachers and parents. Uh, I got a lot of communication uh, and concerns uh, regarding this consultant. So I'm going to read what I wrote. Parents, staff, community members, I have concerns. Teachers live in the district. This is why I put a consultant on the agenda. On August 8, 22, 23, board meeting, I presented to the board 
reasons why Dr. Dickey should have not been hired. My conclusion I stated, I am asking the board to consider the district going back to the drawing board and find a candidate with better background and also to give the teachers a voice. How do they feel adding more professional development after work hours? We also need to consider teacher retention, which should be a top priority. I also stated teachers do not need more professional development. They need more reading and math intervention. They need counselors. They need social workers. They need dean of students to support with behavior and even bullying. So I had community members asking, well, who is Dr. Dickey uh, on August 8, 2022? So I'm just going to read an article uh, for those uh, that were asking. So here's an article. According to the Atlanta Journal of Constitution News, top Atlanta school official resigned, files release of background report. The Atlanta school district official in charge of the district's expensive and ambitious plan to remake the city school resigned last month and is fighting to keep a report investigating his background secret. The Portland School Board hired a firm to look into Dickey's background before formally hiring him. The re that report and Dr. Dickey's response to it ultimately became a key reason the board saw on hiring him, according to the Oregonian. Public records show a handful of apparently minor court cases, traffic tickets for speeding and driving without a license, a bad check charged more than 20 years ago, and more recently, debts to his homeowners association and to a vendor for Dr. Dickey's education consulting business. The Atlanta Journal, Constitution, and Portland Media outlets asked to see the report under Oregon's public record law. A lawyer representing Dickey asked the district to keep the report secret. The district refused to release it. So on August 8, 2022, I had a lot of teachers and parents concerned with this consultant. Uh, different board members from another state, they did not hire him because of what his background he had and also hiring an attorney for not providing uh, more information that, that he was asked to provide. Uh, now we're in the future. So now that the board gave him a chance, they hire him. Now we are seeing that there are issues going on within the school. And I believe this is just for Title I schools. So one teacher, she read her experience with Dr. Dickey. So that's concerning. Uh, you know, being disrespectful to the teachers, how the students are being treated. Uh, and I did get multiple emails, you know, from teachers even concerning saying that they're staying after school hours. Are they getting any compensation? They're getting, they're getting more training on top of training and they are very exhausted. Uh, and also there's no comfort, like when Dr. Dickey comes in, into their training or classroom, they feel that there's no uh, transparency and the way he treats them, they don't feel that they're treated as professional. Uh, and it's also concerning with this teacher reading the email that we had district personnel watching this and this should not be allowed. We, we need to make sure that we have consultants or any administration, how they're going to treat our teachers, because the reality is, if our teachers leave the districts, who, are, who is going to get hurt? The students. You know, highly qualified teachers are hard to get. So what happened is, I hear, you know, teachers, oh, we got, you know, someone that took over the classroom, basically body in the classroom. Is that what we want, you know, for you know, we need to do everything that we can to support our highly qualified teachers. They went to the university, college of education, they're trained, you know, to make sure 
that the future of this, of this country is going to be educated and that we're going to continue with, you know, with having a freedom of speech. Because just imagine if we don't have a strong education. We need funding in education, you know, in order to make sure that we maintain our freedom of speech. And how are we going to do this? By supporting our teachers. You know, listen to them, listen to their voice. This should, this should have been heard on August 8th, on August 22nd of this year. But to me, I feel that the teacher's voices, the parents' voices, was not taken into consideration. So I'm going to read the last part. The public and staff has informed me that there is no transparency in our district. Teachers and students have been disrespected and treated terribly while district staff have been aware. We do not need an employee who is fighting not to give up public records and was willing to hire an attorney. We do not need an employee who treats individuals terrible and disrespectful. I am asking the board to consider the consult consultant as an action item for the next board meeting to be removed and dismissed from all the Title I school. Uh, if I can have the board uh, views and opinion on this topic. Um, Stephanie? Mr. Stacerman, can I go? Uh, Stephanie? Um, I, I obviously you recall. Can't vote, you can't discuss anything that you would vote on. It's not um, agenda side. It's a discussion. No, I was just going to discuss. Yeah, it's just, she's just discussing. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted yeah. to, because Mrs. Paper, uh, President Paperman said that uh, back in August, we had received a group of, of emails from teachers on the 22nd. And I think kind of the idea back then was that we were wrapping our heads around it. It was the beginning of the school year. Things get really chaotic during that time. It's a challenging time. Let's give it some time and we'll, you know, hope for the best. So, um, I just want to start by saying that when I ran last year, I worked alongside our amazing DVUSD teachers, and we knocked on doors, and we had so many amazing conversations. I, I made a promise to those teachers that if I was elected, I would be their voice. And I strongly feel that if we do not support our teachers, our students are the ones that suffer. Just like last fall, I spent the last weeks having many, many conversations with teachers to try and put together what is occurring within our consultant, Dr. Dickey. There are always at least two sides to a story. When we were discussing, discussing standards-based grading, we heard from teachers and staff the positive and the negative of what they experienced. In the conversation of Dr. Dickey, I have yet to receive any emails of support for the program. And I want to thank Mrs. Cole and Ms. Dallas for coming here tonight and speaking out because it takes a lot of bravery and courage to do so. Um, I'm heavily concerned with, with what I've heard. I have um, spoken with teachers. I've received emails. I have two that I got permission from the, the teachers that I would like to share. I'm not going to share their names, but they did give me permission to read. They couldn't be here tonight. I wanted to give some feedback on Dr. Dickey for the Title I schools. I know he was hired by the district to help Title I schools bring up test scores. He is the only going to Title I schools. So Title I teachers are going to more meetings and, put, and more put on their plate with zero compensation and extra time. Our titles needs, Title I schools need smaller class sizes, more support staff, more behavior support, full-time deans. We do not need more people to tell us what to do and putting more on our own plates. We have Title I schools with no art or music teachers and schools with only a P one PE teacher. This doesn't allow regular prep time for those teachers and it is not good for the kids. We have schools with no counselors. Some schools special teachers have two preps and other schools have no art or music. I have taught at several schools in the district and I am one of the PE leads for K-8 PE and there is no way this would be allowed at a northern school. It just wouldn't. They would have some filing in or someone from di district office would be helping out at least a few days a week. Yes, Title I kids are tougher, higher needs, more severe behavior, and more kids on IEP. Mirage has seven and a half sped teachers. We need more help, not more things put on our plate. 
excuse me, the district should be supporting us with more people, not more programs. Support Title I schools like a non-Title I. And I have another one. Um, I have not been impressed with Dr. Dickey's trainings. I am someone who takes training seriously and truly tries to use these times to learn and to provide more for my students. I am on the eight, my 18th year in this district, and when I have asked specific questions to my needs, he does not give me a specific but gives high-frequency vocabulary words that are not helpful. Every single time we have met online, he has cut the meeting short for a wide variety of reasons, catching a flight, bad Wi-Fi signal. My time could be better spent with our on-our campus coach giving me specific feedback for what I need to do to help support my students. We do not need more people telling us how to do things, but we need more time and we need more direct feedback from people who know our student population. In this school I work at, we have severe behavioral issues that affect learning daily. We have an overabundance of students with undiagnosed dyslexia, dysgraphia issues. Our classes in Title I's make learning hard. We have an overabundance of IEP students with high needs and very little support to move students. We need more people who specialize in helping the specific needs of students. Also, the curriculum we are supposed to teach our students is irrelevant when students cannot read or at or near grade level. It is nearly impossible to teach any other content area. Or we need more specialized people actually working with our students, not having someone telling us what to do and how to do it. If we could do it, we would. Title I schools are in pure survival mode. So um, that's just a piece of some of the, uh, the emails that I've gotten. And uh, like I said, when I was elected and when I ran, I, I will be a voice for our teachers and therefore a voice for our students. And I didn't want to share that with our community. And I would um, at minimum request that we put a pause to Dr. Dickey and go from there um, at minimum. So. President Paperman is, is what you said to have him, um, you know, removed. I'm not opposed to that at this point. I feel like I've done my research. I have not just um, heard from a handful of people. Um, I, I've really taken the time to to speak with teachers, and um, I am slightly disappointed that more didn't show up today to talk. But I think they're scared. I know they're scared. And it took a lot of courage for Mrs. Cole to come and do that today, and Miss Dallas. Um, but if, bottom line, if we don't take care of our teachers, our kids are not going to be taken care of. And these teachers already have so much on their plate. I mean, I've, I've been a general ed teacher. I have not been a sped teacher. But that simply alone was pre-COVID with no extra things in a, in a very privileged school here in Deer Valley. And, it was really hard. So when I think about a teacher who now has a child that's coming in in the morning and doesn't know where their next meal is coming from, or maybe experienced some violence the night before, and then they are expected to come to school ready to learn, um, to me, that's crazy. Uh, I would like to see us investing in our teachers and helping them understand child trauma and equip them with the tools that they need. Um, I will add, I went to a trauma training that the Arizona Education Association put on a few weeks ago. It was a two-part um, program, and I didn't know about it, but when I found out about it, I went to the second one. And the amazing thing about this program is that it provided teachers with tools, not that they had to completely rewrite their, their lesson plans or restructure any way that they've ever taught, but yet it gave them tools to be able to Hand, be able to speak with their students and talk with them. Um, and just little things like changing the way they talk to them or having some sort of interaction and, and understanding that some kids don't want to hug and that scares them, but maybe a high five is a great idea. Anyway, my point is, is that there are solutions that we can provide for our teachers in our Title I schools that will help them um, support our Title I students. And until we can make that solid and we can make our teachers feel like we hear them and we're going to give them the tools that they need uh, 
to be able to take care of their children, then we just don't have a right to come in and start um, forcing a new way of teaching just to improve the test scores. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Semachik. Uh, Mrs. Orway, do you have something to say? I always have something to say. Come on. Um, I am, at, at the very least, I would like to be able to go a little bit backwards, understand how uh, and why we looked for a person um, to help. I know that we had so many gaps in our Title I schools. Um, prior to COVID, we have COVID, and then we just have our schools, our Title I schools holding on to um, very low ratings. I mean, our, our, our kids uh, do their K-6, and then they go to the middle school, and, and they're not caught up. So I would really like to understand the how we came upon the need how we decided, again, that this one person was going to not be the magic bullet, but certainly do something. Because when you read, uh, he apparently, or when we read the things that we had gotten and the research shows that um, he moved grade levels, or yes, he moved students from uh, being behind a grade level to a grade level. So there's like a whole bunch of things that I would like to understand. And then I would like to see some kind of a, uh, okay, we have Dr. Dickey or a consultant that does this on this side. How would it look and how would we afford to have um, teaching coaches who are going to tell you how to teach again um, or whatever other personnel that... Um, perhaps we could hire. Now, of course, we did have the override pass, so maybe hiring extra people might be a little bit more difficult, but we've also got to look at what the, um, the uh, yes, I'm sorry, it's a little bit of the chemo brain sticking out right now, the contract to see what, what ramifications are. So I, I think I'm not looking for a vote. I'm looking for a preview on something about all of what I said and what the other four or three board members have said, because I don't think Mr. Carver is leading yet. Thank you, Mrs. Orway. Mr. Carver. Thank you, President Paperman. Uh, as Ms. Ordway mentioned, and, and, and Ms. Simichek, um, I'm, I'm keen to the concerns that we have with our Title I schools, and, and I think that there's a lot of different things that we can do to help and to Mr. Ordway's point, I, I would, I guess I'd like to understand the how that we ended up with deciding that Dr. Dickey would be a good solution. I understand that his research has generated some good results, but um, it is, his character seems to be creating uh, a little bit of a uh, flammable reaction here. And I'm just wondering if we're going to get, very good return on in our investment with everything else that's going along with it. So I, I, I don't think that there's necessarily something to vote on at this point to Ms. Ordway's point, but um, I, would, I do think that there's good reason to have some in-depth conversation and, and it doesn't hurt to have the board involved in that. I, again, I know that we keep bringing up study sessions, but there's only so many things that we can do in a business meeting, but I think that it would be worth a a topic, a brainstorming uh, session to to hear what the administration is doing concerning Title Ones, and to give the community an opportunity to share their insight as to what they think is is is, is a relative solution, and to hear from the board. I know that each of us have our own ideas of what it looks like uh, to be sex successful, and to hopefully close the gap between Title One schools and. In, in those schools that aren't. And um, I know that we'd each like to have an active uh, participating role in that. So maybe that's something that we could that we could look at doing. As far as the Dr. Dickey topic goes, I, he is apparently
the only his, his own worst enemy at this particular point, and I don't know. Like like I mentioned, I'm not sure that the return on investment is there to continue the partnership with uh, as much damage that seems to keep uh, piling up. But uh, that's that's my two cents, President Pepperman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cover, Mrs. Fisher. Um, I don't want this to sound like an I told you so, because it's not. But we had a lot of discussion about Dr. Dickey to begin with. And, and everything, the concerns that, that, that we brought forward um, have come to fruition. And at this point, I understand there, there's a couple things. Number one, we approved a contract. So I do think it needs to be on our next agenda for a vote, whether it's to pause or to stop. It needs to be something on an agenda. We need to know what our legal um, out is. Do we have, what is, what is our, our, um, our clause within the contract to terminate the contract? That's number one basic business, we need to know, can we just terminate the contract? Number two, we can't just wait and see. We have teachers that everything that we discussed and everything that had been brought forward prior to this being approved are telling us that it is in fact true and happening to them. And and that breaks my heart. That, that we we... First, I want to say ditto to, to what Ms. Simichek said as far as the emails from our teachers because she read it beautifully is exactly what our teacher said. The one thing I would like to add that she missed was, was um, in, in your email. And I, I think everybody in this room, maybe not the kids, but everyone that's an adult in this room has heard uh, uh, the, the, the analogy of a tube of toothpaste when you squeeze it all out, try and get it back in. And, and we need to know how we're going to at least stop it from bleeding outward. That's number one. And I love, because I love analogies, get a nice pristine white paper, stab a hole in it, and then pull whatever you stabbed out and tell me if it's healed up. And I will tell you it is not. The biggest thing out of all the emails we received that broke my heart was the student who they had made progress and they were put backwards as a result. Because you can build trust in a kid over time and you can lose that trust in one action. One action. And then it's going to take a minimum of 20 more actions to to even get it back, but no matter what, you are not going to heal that, that occurrence. It doesn't just go away. And for anybody who thinks it does, I challenge them. I'll give you my son's phone number because he will tell you what teacher works where, who works here, who works there, who hurt him, who loved him. He's autistic, he's 20, 24, and he remembers every single time. The ones he loves are because they loved him, and he knew, and it took years of building that trust. We cannot wait to have another occurrence of what happened in that classroom to happen in any other classroom. At a minimum, we need to vote to pause to not have that occur again. Not only the disrespect for our teachers, but the damage to a child, because it does not just go away. Um, so I will join with Ms. Paperman and Ms. Semichek and say I want it at least on an agenda, whether it ends up as a pause or what it ends up as, I don't know. But um, I do want to have a legal opinion and knowledge of what is the termination clause within our contract. Um, and so I would ask that that be brought to the next meeting as an action item. Uh, President Paperman, if, if I may, um, uh, can I comment to a couple of the remarks that have been made?
Well, can you repeat? I, can I comment to a couple of the remarks yes, that have yes, been yes, made? Yes, It would be yes. helpful. So uh, let me start off with just um, putting again in context, uh, because there's been several points that have been uh, made. As far as the uh, why behind Dr. Dickey, uh, let me just remind uh, those who are watching that the board meeting on the 22nd, we went into that quite in detail um, as far as why we were looking at uh, getting additional professional development and training for um, our staff that are at our Title I schools. Um, and as well, let me mention a couple of comments that were made um, during that time that I, there is no one here that wants it to be a bad experience for any uh, staff member or any teacher. And I have said that numerous times. I reiterated that to Mrs. Cole uh, when I met with her and uh, reminded her of why we're looking at Dr. Dickey, and again, that there is no intent at all to provide a bad experience. And I apologize to her for uh, having a what was clearly a less than optimal experience um, in the classroom with uh, Dr. Dickey. I, I also want to be clear, too, in terms of some of the comments that are being made about uh, an interaction or interactions that were with students, that, that that is not a shared agreement as far as what happened in that classroom. There were multiple adults in that room, and some parts of what uh, Ms. Cole has shared uh, are a shared understanding in terms of the style with which Dr. Dickey had spoke with uh, Ms. Cole, but it is not an agreement as far as any interaction that Dr. Dickey had with students that were in that room. So I want, I want that to be put out there as well, because we too, we do not want any um, uh, poor interactions to happen, not only with Dr. Dickey, but no staff member or adult um, that, that is on campus. What I would um, ask President Paperman is, what, I think I believe the 29th is my, um, the Title I principles. And that would be an opportunity for me to check in with them uh, and get some feedback because heretofore, and I've explained this to others, the overwhelming feedback that has been brought to me has been on the positive side as far as Dr. Dickey's uh, impact on folks. When I walk classrooms and I am with uh, teachers and administrators, I check in quite a bit uh, with, with the staff and I'll ask them, tell me about Dr. Dickey. What are you taking away that's positive? What questions do you have? Um, what are you thinking about as far as next steps? And the comments that uh, you have uh, read from members that have sent you items, th those are comments that I have not heard. And I have not heard those from administrators either. And so uh, in terms of getting feedback from all, because uh, I, I have not put out a request on social media to have folks uh, submit to me items about Dr. Diggy. Um, so I think it would be prudent to speak with the administrators and then I have no problem coming up with some way of or method of collecting input from the staff. I think that would be fine from our title schools and to gauge where they're at as far as um, how they're feeling towards Dr. Dickey. And then bringing that back uh, to the board, I could do that on I think our, our meeting after the 28th is December 14th um, that we have in December. And so I could bring that. I, I have no problem bringing back what uh, they are feeling with respect to the PD that they received so far. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zorberg. I also uh, would like to take consideration, uh, Mrs. Shemacek uh, share that we do have staff that are in fear. You know, so how transparent and honest are they going to be to communicate and say, well, this about Dr. Dickey, you know, like at least, you know, we have these three staff members that spoke today and um, you know they spoke to Ms. Semachek and they feel safe that they can come and speak but the other ones they told me they're afraid to speak regarding the principles was interesting we have previous board members that were in the Deer Valley School District I got information from them from what principals are saying so this is telling me that in Deer Valley we have a culture of no transparency and fear, you know, they, they're not, principals are not going to tell you the truth because they are afraid to, you know, they're afraid to speak up. And this is why in the past in board meetings, I would tell the principal, stand up for your teachers, 
You know, these are your teachers, no matter what, stand up for them. But they are afraid. So I just want, you know, to take that into consideration. And, and I would have to disagree with you on that, uh, President Paverman, as far as the principals feeling fear. Uh, I, I do not believe that they are shy in voicing to me uh, if they feel that something is going well or if something is not going well. So <clears throat> that, that particular part, I, I, I do not see it the same way uh, that you are seeing it. Uh, with respect to a concern as far as what teachers may or may not say, we could do something in terms of some type of anonymous uh, survey uh, with our staff to see what they're saying with that. That, again, would not be something that I'm to. Um, I agree, you know, do you want to measure uh, doing their survey, district surveys? I'm also requesting for DVA, the teachers, uh, association to do their own survey uh, so we can see an alignment and if parents would like to do a survey you're welcome to also to do a survey on your uh, how your students are doing uh, in the classroom with the consultant thank you so any oh mrs say. simmons yeah um, on top of if we were to do the survey, I, I think it's a fantastic idea. I would also like to include the number of students that a teacher has each day, um, the number of preps that they get, and um, how many students on IEPs that they have, or um, I guess that could be pretty overwhelming because there are things like speech that are on IEP that, Anyway, any, any, anything else that kind of measures the, the teacher's workload, um, because I, a, a lot of what I am hearing is not only do I have all of this stuff going on, I'm not getting my prep, um, and then I have to do, do all these, I have to do these meetings, I have to attend these meetings and, and, and rewrite some, th some, some things out. So um, I really would like to include on that survey questions that would help us kind of understand the workload that our teachers are having. Well, uh, Ms. Simichek, could you repeat those points? Because some of those we wouldn't need to put into a survey. We, we have that data as far as caseloads, et cetera. Uh, yeah. Um, well, as far as number of students, that's probably, we can probably look that up. But when I say um, number of preps that they have, I mean literally the number of preps they have, not scheduled preps. And then there's an emergency and they get called out of their prep time and they have to leave or mm -hmm. they have to meet with somebody or a parent or go attend an IEP meeting or do sub rotation. I mean, mm -hmm. really, how many preps have you had this year in your Title I schools to help support you in being a successful teacher? Is, is that the one item in addition to the number of or the caseloads that you mentioned? I think it would be important to talk about teachers and the number of IEPs that they have, although it sounds like we might be able to pull that information yeah, that could be as pulled. well. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to move on to oh, Mrs. Ashila. For the record, Mrs. Orway left the meeting at 8. We're going to move on to item five, district report. Mr. Milgorino, finance report. Uh, President Paperman, members of the board, Dr. Finch, um, just in the interest of time, I'll be brief. Uh, we do have the uh, MO uh, report for the month of October. Uh, to share with you this evening, our working budget, uh, $277 million. Uh, at the present time, we are uh, expecting um, uh, all of that $277 million to be, uh, to be encumbered. <clears throat> uh, that does not include the almost $4.2 million that we did not allocate this year, um, again, um, intentionally, and then the additional $8.4 million that the state allocated in one-time funding that was, uh, that was allocated to us after we had made our salary and benefit recommendation to the board. So um, right now we're currently standing with a uh, projected carry forward of $12.5 million into uh, the upcoming fiscal year, which would be the fiscal year 25. I'd be happy to answer any questions on the boards by now. Any questions, board members? No question. Okay, we're going to we're going to move on to 
Item six, consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve consent agenda? I move the governing board approve consent agenda A through J as presented. Second. Sorry, second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. All those opposed, say nay. Aye. Aye. I'm going to, I just need to explain my vote. Um, oh wait, it's a separate item, so I, I can vote a I on it. Passes for vote. We're moving to item seven. Action A, approve employee professional development out of state. Mrs. Fisher, can I get a motion? I move that the governing board approve all employee out-of-state travel for professional development per governing board policy, GCCE. Any questions, board members? Are we need? Second. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. All that opposed say nay. Aye. Aye. Um, this is where I need to explain my vote. I um, did receive information um, regarding some of the content of this employee travel. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned that this it is completely against everything that this district stands for, against um, what we um, what we claim that we don't teach. Um, why would we send individuals to a training um, to teach them what we claim that we do not teach on this district and will never teach on this district? Um, and so for that reason, um, I, just, I just can't approve some of the out-of-state travel. Uh, it's just not appropriate for anything that this district claims that it will never teach. So I vote nay. What's the total vote, uh, Sheila? Four? Oh, three? Oh, uh, I, yeah, I already said I, yeah. Uh, three, one, thank you. Moving to item B, approve, addenda, pre approval. Mrs. Fisher, can I get a motion? I move that the governing board approve uh, the addenda as presented. Second. Mr. Meglarino, do you have a presentation for this? Uh, President Paperman, no, we do not. Any questions on this item? All those in favor, say aye. All that opposed, say nay. Aye. Aye. For the same reason that I cannot, uh, in good conscience, um, uh, force students to raise funds to pay for salaries. Um, so I'm gonna vote no um, until we get something that the students say, yes, we want to go out and raise funds to pay salaries. Um, I cannot vote for an 850 going um, to a pre-approval. Moving, um, pass it 3-1. Moving to item C. Approve the district performance pay percentage for classified administrator and exam employee groups for fiscal year 2023-2024, Mr. Migler. Uh, President Paperman, members of the board, oh, Dr. Finch. Sorry, sorry, can I have a motion for this item? I move that the governing board accept administrator's recommendation to approve the FY 23-24 district performance pay Percentage for classified, administrative, and exempt employee groups at 2%. Do I have second. a second? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Miglarino. Um, this is a an annual item uh, that the board has considered um, just as a matter of reference. Uh, the When the classroom site fund was uh, first started uh, back in the year 2001, um, a couple years later there was a salary uh, committee that uh, looked at uh, um, making adjustments to our, all of our salary schedules. 
during that discussion, uh, we, uh, at the board at that time, implemented a performance pay plan uh, for the all of the rest of the staff because the classroom side fund prov provided a performance pay plan that was exclusively for teachers initially. Um, so this has been in existence since the 2005-2006 uh, uh, school year and historically the percentage has been 2 percent. Uh, we asked the board to approve that again for this year as uh, this, this is a goal-oriented um, uh, performance pay plan, meaning that the employees have to uh, generate a goal and achieve that goal in order to earn the 2%. Uh, so uh, this has been approved in different times of the year. We did um, in intend to move this up on the calendar so that the employees would know what was at stake with the goal that they're establishing with their supervisor. I'd be happy to answer any questions the board might have. Any questions, board member? I do have a question. I believe I had an email from a parent, one parent. Uh, the process when we get a new curriculum is view for the public to come and see, right? Yes. No, that's next. Okay. This is, this is, um, oh, performance, performance pay. pay. Okay, I'm looking at the bottom. Sorry, it's late. Okay, so no questions then, Mr. Carver. Mr. No, Carver. I have no, I have no questions. Thank no you. questions. Okay, so then we're going to go to the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All that opposed, say nay. Aye. Passes four. Oh. Next item is preview. Item eight, uh, six A English. Language Art Curriculum Materials Adoption Recommendation, Dr. Galligan. President Paperman, thank you very much. We'll wait for the presentation to come up. Um, again, President Paperman, members of the board, Dr. Finch tonight, Kathy White and I bring um, the 6-8 ELA Adoption Committee's recommendations. That committee was actually run by Ms. Donnell Stevenson, who is our 6-12 ELA CIAS. However, she has been um, ill the past couple of days, so we will do our best um, Kathy oversaw much of that as well, so we'll do our best to present everything to you. President Paperman, members of the board, and Dr. Finch, I want to begin by sharing the mission statement of our ELA department in DVUSD. The statement offers a per perspective that the 6th through 8th grade adoption committee heavily considered when selecting a resource to propose tonight. The mission of DVUSD ELA is to empower students with diverse learning styles, regardless of their unique needs and abilities. We are committed to providing an inclusive and equitable learning environment for all 6th through 8th grade students, including those with special needs, gifted students, EL students, and those in general education classes. We believe that every child deserves access to the highest levels of English language arts learning, fostering their full potential and enabling them to thrive in a rapidly changing world. Furthermore, our pursuit of the ideal sixth through eighth grade ELA resource has been driven by a strong emphasis on alignment with the Arizona English Language Arts Standards and the essential skills that characterize the DVUSD portrait of a graduate. The existing sixth through eighth grade ELA curriculum has effectively served us for over nine years, yet it is imperative that we contemplate its replacement due to the following reasons. One, updated instructional resources. Our current district adopted resource implemented in 2015 lacks the latest pedagogical techniques and research-based <coughs> teaching methodologies. It was initially designed to guide teachers as they familiarize themselves with the ELA standards that were being adopted at that time by the state. However, it has become outdated for both educators and students. The lesson design 
aiming to script each lesson has become lengthy and doesn't integrate the latest research-based instructional routines. Additionally, a modern curriculum will address diverse <coughs> learning styles. It will provide resources and strategies to accommodate diverse learning styles, enabling tailored approaches and accessibility tools to meet individual student needs. This ensures personalized instruction and better support for our expanding EL population. Moreover, a new curriculum will incorporate current technology. It will integrate current technology to elevate the learning environment, customize learning experiences, and offer prompt feedback to students. The communication regarding the sixth through eighth grade ELA adoption adhered to the curriculum resource adoption framework, incorporating outreach strategies to involve all stakeholders in the process. We initiated communication with stakeholders in March of 2023 and sustained it through November of 2023, utilizing diverse channels and methods. Collaborating with the DVSD Communication and Community Engagement Department played a pivotal role in reaching out to parents and community members. Additionally, schools housing 6th through 8th grade and ELA teachers facilitated communication via email with the parents. In March of 2023, an extensive advertisement for committee members generated a substantial response from our DVSD stakeholders. The formation of the ELA adoption, 6th through 8th ELA adoption committee occurred through a random selection process and details about the committee's composition and selection methodology were documented and accessible on the 6th through 8th ELA adoption webpage. The committee structure ensured appropriate representation across 6th through 8th grade ELA grade levels and diverse DBUSD regions. The 6th 8th ELA Adoption Committee convened for a series of six two-hour Zoom meetings, concluding with a final session in August of 2023, which took place after the public review period to deliberate on the received feedback. Following the public review process, the committee gathered feedback from a total of 60 stakeholders, including 52 DVUSD employees, five parents, and three community members. Notably, the feedback exhibited a well-balanced con contribution from various grade levels, showcasing an equitable distribution of input. Many stakeholders provided feedback encompassing multiple grade levels. Impressively, 90% of those engaged in the public review expressed that study sync was fully aligned with the Arizona ELA standards. After extensive deliberation, incorporating the valuable insights gathered from both the public review and the committee, the 6-8 ELA Adoption Committee is thrilled to propose our unanimous recommendation, study sync. This resource is slated for implementation in the 2024-2025 school year with a planned adoption period spanning five years. Study Sync aligns seamlessly with Deer Valley's educational objectives and is poised to effectively cater to the reading, writing, speaking, and listening needs of both our students and our educators. Throughout the public review, stakeholders consistently favored Study Sync emphasizing its alignment with the st standards and its provision of resources to scaffold the students' learning experiences. This slide delineates the planned implementation schedule. Full implementation is scheduled for the 2024-2025 school year. Teachers will have the opportunity to participate in professional development sessions scheduled for this coming January May, June, and also during the fall. The costs for professional development trainers are encompassed within the resource cost. And these sessions will be available annually throughout the duration of our five-year contract. The Steady Sync resource aligns seamlessly with the Arizona standards and stands as a crucial investment for both our teachers and students. This comprehensive resource is poised to benefit more than 7,000 ELA students in grades 6 through 8 while providing support to over 200 teachers. The total cost of the 6 through 8 ELA adoption encompassing tax amounts to $783,394.
Importantly, this cost falls within the allocated budget set for the curricular adoptions in this current 23-24 school year. With this investment, we not only fulfill our educational objectives for middle school English language arts, but also operate within the confines of our fiscal year um, 24 budget. We extend our sincere gratitude for our board members' thoughtful consideration of StudySync as the recommended 6th through 8th grade ELA district adopted resource. We are enthusiastic about the potentials of this program brings and both the members of our 6-8 ELA Adoption Committee and I and Kathy deeply value your support in endorsing this recommended ELA resource for the benefit of our students in middle school and our educators. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to item B. Oh, do you have a question on this item? Oh, okay. Paul, do you have a question? No, President Paperman, thank you. Thank you. Moving to item B, K-5 Math Resources Adoption Recommendation. Dr. Galligan. President Paperman, thank you for your patience. Once again, tonight, Kim Edelson, our K-8 Math Curriculum Instruction and Specialist, Assessment Specialist, and I will present the K-5 Math Adoption Committee's recommendation for mathematics materials to be implemented during the 2024-25 school year. President Paperman, members of the board, and Dr. Finch, it is with great enthusiasm and a sense of pride that I am here tonight as a representative of our exceptional K-5 Math Adoption Committee, some of whom are here with us this evening. We are here to share the results of our extensive journey in the adoption and to present our resounding recommendation. Our quest for the ideal K-5 math resource has been guided by a steadfast commitment to aligning with the Arizona mathematics standards, as well as the essential skills that define the portrait of a graduate. The current K-5 math curriculum has served us well over the last decade, but it is imperative that we consider its replacement due to the need for updated instructional resources, including the latest pedagogical techniques and research-based teaching methodologies. The current adopted District Adopted Resource was adopted in 2013 and is outdated in both design and function. In addition, a modern curriculum will address diverse learning styles by providing an array of resources and strategies designed to accommodate varying learning preferences and unique student needs. This approach enables customized instruction and enhances accessibility for all. Further, an up-to-date curriculum will incorporate cutting-edge technology to elevate the educational atmosphere, customize learning journeys, and offer prompt feedback. Our communication strategy for the K-5 math adoption adhered to the established curriculum resource adoption framework, ensuring that all stakeholders were actively engaged in the process. We initiated our, our outreach in April 2023 and continued it through November 2023. The call for committee members launched in April utilized the full range of district communication resources, including the district website, newsletters, emails, school marquees, and flyers. Collaborating with the DVSD communication and community engagement team played a vital role in reaching out to parents and community members. The committee selection was finalized in May, leading to eight scheduled meetings throughout June and concluding with a final meeting at the close of the public review in October. The public review period ran from July 10th to September 29th, 
culminating in tonight's governing board preview and action scheduled for November 28th. As mentioned, in April 2023, a widespread call for committee members re resulted in a robust response from DVSD stakeholders. The K-5 Math Adoption Committee was selected through a random process with the composition and selection methodology thoroughly documented and accessible on the K-5 Math Adoption webpage. We ensured representation from across K-5 grade levels and DVSD regions. As illustrated on this slide, the K-5 Math Adoption Committee was comprised of 26 DVUSD employees, nine parents, and two community members. The K-5 Math Adoption Committee convened for a series of eight three-hour in-person meetings, culminating in a final Zoom meeting in October following the public review to assess feedback. There were nine committee meetings. The first four meetings were held during the week of June 5th through 8th. During this time, the committee reviewed the Arizona Mathematics Standards and current adopted resource and evaluated potential K-5 math resources using an in-depth rubric. The following week, June 12th through 15th, there were vendor presentations and the committee narrowed the focus to two resources for public review. The public review was open from July 10th through September 29th. On October 4th, the committee met one final time to review public comments and select a resource to recommend to the governing board. After conducting the public review, we received feedback from a total of 148 stakeholders, including 95 DVSD employees, 48 parents, and five community members. It is worth noting that the feedback was well balanced across all grade levels, demonstrating a fairly even distribution of input. Many stakeholders represented multiple grade levels within their feedback. After thorough consideration, taking into account the valuable insights gathered from the public review and the committee, the K-5 Math Adoption Committee is delighted to present our unanimous recommendation, iReady Classroom Mathematics 2024, to be implemented in the 24-25 school year with a planned adoption period spanning six years. This resource aligns perfectly with Deer Valley's educational goals and will best serve the mathematical needs of our students and educators. Here are some examples of public review feedback from our different <coughs> stakeholders. During the public review, stakeholders consistency, consistently chose iReady Classroom Mathematics 2024, highlighting its sole focus on math, flexibility and depth of multiple day lessons, cohesion and engagement across digital and print versions, user friendliness for teachers, students, and parents, valuable actionable insights from assessment data, use of student data to create individualized learning plans, and a straightforward comprehensive nature. In a standout comment from a veteran top performing fifth grade teacher on the AASA state assessment, she enthusiastically exclaimed, I can't wait to teach my students using this curriculum. I love it. Our goal is to initiate the ordering process in December for licenses and materials. All materials will be procured and distributed in advance of the introductory professional development session for teachers, scheduled to take place, place from May to September 2024. This training will be inclusive for all K-5 math teachers, extending to teachers new to DVUSD next year. It is important to note that the cost of all professional development sessions is already integrated into the overall resource cost and will continue to be provided annually throughout the entire six-year contract. Our full implementation plan is set for the 24-25 school year. The iReady Classroom Mathematics resource aligns well with Arizona Mathematics Standards and will be an invaluable investment for our teachers and students. 
This comprehensive resource will directly benefit the learning of mathematics for over 13,000 K-5 students and empower over 700 dedicated math teachers in their instruction. The total cost of the K-5 math adoption, which includes shipping, stands at approximately $4,013,857. Importantly, this falls within the budget allocated for curricular adoptions in the 23-24 school year. With this investment, we not only meet our educational goals for K-5 mathematics, but also work within our fiscal year 24 budget. Again, um, two adoptions this meeting. Thank you for your thoughtful consideration of iReady Classroom Mathematics 2024 as the K-5 math adopted resource. We are excited about the possibilities this program offers and the members of the K-5 math adoption committee, as Kim mentioned, them are here. And I greatly appreciate your support in providing the recommended math resources for our students and teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Galligan. I would like to say that I did use iReady with my second graders and I worked in a Title I school and I love the program for the reason that in my classroom I have refugee students, ELD students, English speaker, and I love how it showed the progress throughout time. There was fun activities too, aligned to the standards, and it individualized differentiated instruction where the student is and what I needed to do to bring them up in mathematics or reading. So, I mean, I love the program since I had, you know, different, you know, abilities within my classroom. Any questions, board members? Um, no, just, just a thank you for the community for, for doing, um, being a part of this and also to the community members who have sent us emails regarding the curriculum. It sounds like iReady is extremely popular. Mrs. Fisher? I was going to tease and say, were you not going to bring that one forward? Because we got a lot of support for it. <coughs> but it's, it's had a lot of support in the district for a long time. It's one of the programs that was recommended for my son as well. Um, so I've heard about five years worth of good um, on this one um, program. So thank you. Yeah, they told us, though, because it's good to know. Mr. Carver. Thank you, President Paperman. I just want to thank the uh, community for getting involved in the process, uh, educating themselves on the uh, options that we have available to help educate the children and, and getting themselves involved. And I'm just really excited to see how many people are constantly trying to find ways to either become part of the committee or at least to make sure that they respond back during the, uh, the, the open review uh, time period before we make our decision. So, Thank you so much to the community, to the educators that uh, take time to get involved in these processes uh, to help us all make better informed decisions for the kids. Thank you, Mr. Carver. Moving on to report, superintendent report. Thank you, Ms. Paperman. Well, it's been a month since we've been together and a lot of exciting things have happened in the last month. Uh, I just want to pause for a second and thank Stacy for speaking about the bond and override. Uh, uh, the good news is we actually received more yes votes than 2019. The bad news is that we have pretty much had a full court anti-public ed press on us. Um, and so uh, there is uh, some uh, silver lining in there is that our we went a year early on purpose. And uh, so we can uh, run the exact same a bond and override in 2024. We were trying to avoid the presidential uh, chaos that's going to come from that election, but uh, what, that's probably what I'll be recommending to the board is to uh, do that again. And because uh, obviously our needs are not changing and TSMC is coming ready or not. And so, um, but thank you for all the work that all the folks did. And obviously you did, uh, we did, or the community did actually provide more yes votes than we had actually in 2019. So a uh, good job. The, um, the, the one thing I want to add about the override, uh, because that, uh, that reinforces why it was an anti-public ed, but the, the, um, both issues went down with the same numbers, which is very unusual. And uh, in that override, as you mentioned, has been around since 1991, 8% of our salaries are in there. 
of every employee in the district. Uh, class size is in there. All day kindergarten is in there. Um, and then student um, supports are in there. And that's what uh, the people voted on. That's what the literature and uh, the actual uh, vote stated. So that's what they voted on. So uh, we'll give the community another chance to review that impact, about $35 million on our system. And uh, hopefully we can have a different outcome on uh, the next lap. Other things that happened uh, in the last month, we, uh, Dr. Z and I uh, surprised uh, Principal Hood, Jamie Hood at Title School Paseo Hills as Principal of the Year. And uh, all of her staff were there. Uh, she got a standing ovation and we got a chance to brag on her and that was a fun time, put it on social media. We, uh, I did mention that I was going to continue to do conversations with Kurt and I did one uh, virtual here uh, last month. So uh, go back and check that out. There were questions that people sent in and I answered them and so that the pluses, it was recorded. So you can go back and watch it if you'd like. Uh, the questions from the community. We also had uh, uh, Bill Dugan, uh, our aspire, one of our Aspire teachers, uh, passed away in the last month and we had a celebration of a life um, just this my last month as well. Um, and so thanks to everyone that could be able to make that a great staff member at Aspire. I want to thank all the schools for all our Veteran Day celebrations. Uh, that's one thing we do really well is uh, celebrate our veterans throughout the district. And uh, our November one uh, was amazing. And I imagine many of the board members will talk about that in their section. Uh, uh, you met uh, earlier in the, in the uh, celebrations, uh, our Mountain Ridge uh, girls flag football team uh, became the first uh, state runner-ups in uh, history and they did a nice job on the story but uh, storybook run but also this last weekend we had O'Connor girls win the state championship in volleyball um, at the Memorial Stadium there and that's the first one in their history they were 34 and one and only lost one set through the whole tournament of uh, the state tournament so it was great to to watch that success as well. So congratulations to O'Connor. As we also had uh, Mountain Ridge this last Saturday, uh, we won the state title in the AZ NBA um, uh, marching band, Division 5A. And so they're, be, they're trying to be undefeated like they were last year and they won the state ABOTA title. That'll be this Saturday. So if you're interested in seeing that, it's at GCC, it goes, runs all day. I believe um, Deer Valley is also in their run in their division. Um, so uh, come and check them out. They actually broke the record for the number of uh, points that were allowed, according to Ms. Moffitt. It was amazing. And percussion was really good because her son's on percussion. They swept all the categories and broke the record for the number of points. So it would be awesome if they can win the state title again this Saturday. Come check it out. We also did really well in the state test. We had 26 A's, that's the most we ever had in our school history, our district history. Um, we actually had 27 because they didn't count Inspiration Mountain and we are appealing uh, one, of, uh, one of the other ones as well. So we might have 28 by the time the, the paint dries. So thanks to the teams, uh, all the staff and principals and administrators that work hard on continuing to improve our academics. Thanks. Moving on to governing board report, uh, Mrs. Fisher, you requested to go first. Eh? Okay. Why not? Um, it has been a very interesting um, month. Um, I do want to thank uh, Boulder Creek for inviting all board members to come to the homecoming parade. It was uh, it was a fun experience. Um, and uh, I was able to make a short visit to Barry Goldwater to take some olive oil to the um, restaurant, which hopefully I can do that again in the future. Um, now that I changed my schedule, hopefully I can be more on campus on Fridays, um, except for last Friday because my husband is getting old um, and I had to take him away. <laughs> um, board responsibility needs to be taken seriously. Um, we have a real responsibility to this entire district, even when it's not an easy or not positive. The board is not here to uh, be a marketing tool. We have a real responsibility to many individuals, a responsibility 
we cannot just walk away from when it gets hard to stand in the gap. The board needs to be committed to ensure the impact um, on our students and our teachers is the least um, when it comes to the upcoming budget. The bond and override failing um, are a difficulty, but they are not an impossibility. It's not the first time, um, at least not, I, I know it's not the first time that our staff has, but it's not the first time I faced um, having to deal with a budget fall, a shortfall of that nature. Um, but it's the board's responsibility to make sure that that impact is as furthest away from our classroom as possible. Um, scores are very important uh, for many reasons, um, and I want to congratulate all of our schools who improved in their scores. However, um, as I said, unfortunately, uh, this is where the responsibility of the board member comes in, even when it's not considered positive. A deeper look into our data shows that 11 of our K-8 school scores have reduced in proficiency. 17 of our K-8 scores have reduced in growth. Overall, 10 of our K-8 schools had a reduction in their score. Only one of our high schools had a consistent increase across both the proficiency and the college and career readiness. Two improved in proficiency from the prior year. However, they are still below the last meaningful measurable year of 2019. Two had their proficiency decline. Um, I bring this not to admonish any of our staff, but to more so admonish us. We need to look at true data and we need to look at the scores. It's wonderful that we celebrate the A's, but when all we do is paint a pretty picture, then we are not doing our job. And our job is to find ways to offer the support to schools, and that only occurs when we look at declining or, or growth. We have to look at true data. Our overall district score dropped from an A to a B. Um, and I, we need to give everyone a little grace we're coming out of COVID, it was, a, it was a difficult time. But this is where the board needs to be sure that we're looking at true de data. Data comes to us so many ways, but if we just take the data that's presented versus digging deep in, um, then, then we're just going with the flow and just, just making mistakes, um, just accepting. Um, and so it's very important that we do look at that data our, our enrollment is still down 1.3. Yes, um, a lot of districts faced the, the opposition to the bond and override passing, but everyone around ours passed. Um, what's most important is that we take a look at our true data, our true areas of concern and issues, and we start rebuilding the trust with our community because uh, a community that trusts us will vote for us. I remember the last time I was on the board and we were passing that override and it passed by only 300 votes. And I remember dropping to my knees in, in, in my office at Phoenix Union thing, saying, thank God, I don't have to address that. But we do have to address it. And I ask that all board members take our jobs serious. We don't have to just take the cuts because it's what they're said. We need to fight for our students and our teachers and our staff. That's it. Ms. Zemesha. So yes, um, it's been a very busy month, uh, full of great celebrations and school visits and very important conversations. Uh, Inspiration Mountain celebrated their one year anniversary on October 20th by planting a time capsule and sharing great joy in their school through speeches, music, and a visit from the O'Connor Band, who was absolutely amazing. It really was a wonderful celebration um, to honor that one year. On October 25th, I attended the O'Connor Homecoming Parade, which completely brought me back to my high school days. Um, it was a blast. Uh, so I want to just say thank you to Dr. Miller and staff for always making me feel welcome when I come to campus and just for a, a real joyful experience for that homecoming parade. It's the first one I've been to here in Arizona. Um, 
And then that afternoon, we had our pop lunch with our PTSA leaders here at the district office. And um, as I mentioned earlier, the, um, I did attend the AEA trauma training. That was on October 30th at Park Meadows. And this was the second part of a two-part training. And I was just really grateful that I had the able to take part in it. Um, several of our Title I teachers and staff were present to learn ways to help our students who come to school each day not able and or ready to learn because their home life is so challenging. Um, there is going to be another session in January, um, but my hope is that we can possibly bring this training to all of our schools, especially our Title I schools, so that our teachers can have um, fill up their toolboxes with more ideas to help our students without having to rearrange their lessons or learn something brand new on top of their already heavy load. Um, this training offers a great suggestions that can really be implemented immediately. So um, thank you, uh, Kelly Fisher, for inviting me to that. That was wonderful. Um, on November 1st and 2nd, there was a virtual safety and security summit that took place. Um, I kind of was able to jump in and out of the presentations that were extremely informative, very eye-opening, mostly regarding school safety, um, and just walking away of understanding that lifelong learning truly is necessary um, for us to grow and to just help one another successfully and hearing from those people who are so invested in protecting our, our schools. Um, and then on November 2nd, Paul and I met with uh, the fantastic leader of the ASU Human Trafficking Department, um, and we learned a ton. We learned about our students that attend our DVUS schools here um, and how um, they are part of this program. Um, and we were really just um, looking to ways to have a conversation and look forward to having further discussions about it and finding ways to bridge the gap between understanding how serious the human trafficking issue is here in Phoenix, and it affects us right in our own backyard um, with our students that uh, attend our schools, whether as survivors or those who could potentially um, be trafficked in the future and ways we can prevent that from happening and signs and what to look for. Um, and three of our schools have students that uh, feed into them from the program and I would love to be able to, and I know that Ms. Callens who shared the training with us would love to be able to bring our um, principals in on that and us um, as well as our counselors and social workers so we can improve on that a little bit. Um, let's see. And then, yeah, Veterans Day. Veterans Day was so, it was just fantastic. It was, um, I was able to go on November 8th to Terramar and the 9th to Sierra Verde. And so many of our schools had these um, celebrations and I could only go to two because of the timing, but I really, really look forward to just over the next few years, just kind of going to each different one, you know, every couple of years I can go back to the other ones, but just so I can get to see a chance of, of everyone's uh, way of celebrating because they were all really beautiful. Um, they just felt really pure and heartfelt. So I just want to thank our schools for inviting us to their celebrations. Um, and again, I wish I could have attended them all, um, but my hope is just to kind of rotate throughout the years to the different celebrations. And really quickly, um, I just wanted to say I, I love to see that our schools, I would love to see our schools that currently don't offer a celebration to our community to find ways that they can. This might be working with another principal at a current school for ideas and suggestions. It was very clear that a lot of work goes into these celebrations and it takes the entire school to come together to make it happen. Not just a department, a club, or a grade level, but rather the entire school. And it's so important that we are reminded that our schools are the heart of our community and it's what unites us and holds us together. Um, and I just really briefly want to speak on, uh, speaking of community, I, I really thank you for letting me speak. Um, I would like to express my sadness and my concerns regarding the failing of our bond and override. Um, as a parent of DVUSD and a board member, I was in complete shock to witness this fall through. I just want to say that we can do better and we must do better. And I want to thank the DVEA for all of their hard work. It was a pleasure writing postcards together and I want to apologize on behalf of our community. I feel like we let you down and I feel like we let our students down. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carver. 
Thank you, President Paperman. As everybody's mentioned, uh, it's been a long month, uh, been uh, too long in between meetings, but I understand how it goes. I'll run down a little Reader's Digest version of what I've been up to. I've got 12 different interactions here concerning the district and myself uh, over the last couple of weeks. On 10-11, uh, I had a chance to visit with Mountain Shadows, uh, Ms. Gilbert, uh, Park Meadows, uh, Ms. Lanise, and Barry Goldwater High School, Dr. Stoltz. And uh, all three were pleasantly pleased at our level of staffing this year. It hasn't been this good in a long time, but all three also had concerns that really the only place that we're kind of lagging behind in the district uh, and indeed in their campuses was just uh, in special needs. And, you know, that's a hard position to fill, and I've had that conversation uh, with Ms. McCusker, Dr. McCusker, and, and other folks, and, uh, and I know that we've got some financial challenges that we're dealing with, but I, I would like to see us do whatever it takes, really, to try to find a way to make sure that we have the best qualified people to help take care of uh, those special spirits in our school district. Um, the atmosphere on the campuses uh, is amazing. Everybody just seems to be so happy to be there and to be interacting with the children and doing their part uh, to have a positive, uh, to have positive input and a positive effect uh, on these uh, on these children's lives. So I always enjoy my time uh, on the campuses. On the 14th, I was invited out to the district office to participate in the annual DVUSD chili cook-off. I usually shy away from those kind of things because I'm not really into hot foods, but uh, it, was, it was good. We've got some amazing chefs down there, and uh, I was glad to see so many, so many participants. It was, it was a good experience. If you guys ever get a chance, you should make sure that you're around the district office uh, that time of year so that you can uh, help polish off some of those pots of chili. On October 16th, uh, as the ASBA delegate for the DB, for DBUSD, I participated in the Maricopa County meeting. Uh, we discussed uh, up-and-coming meetings, uh, the uh, conference that will be held in December, and uh, we elected our new uh, county co-chair for Maricopa County. October 20th, uh, the Deer Valley High School's homecoming parade, and as everybody here knows, I'm a graduate from Deer Valley High School, so I went to the parade and uh, then to the varsity football game later on that evening, and I was uh, tickled pink to see that we pulled off an amazing win, 41-2 uh, to two over the Copper Canyon Aztecs. It was a good football game. Um, October 25th, the Sandra Dale O'Connor homecoming parade. I tell you what, these community parades that we're putting on uh, for homecoming is amazing. I know that when I was going to school in Dubai School District, the idea of the homecoming parade was each class had a float, and it drove around the track that surrounded the football field. So we've come a long way. I believe uh, Sandra Day had over 40 floats. So if, uh, again, another one of those things, if you have an opportunity and you live in the community, when it gets to be homecoming season in the month of October, there's almost nowhere that you can go without seeing a parade for Deer Valley. And, and uh, it's an amazing opportunity to see our kids out there celebrating their schools and having a good time. Again, on October 27th, with Boulder Creek uh, homecoming parade. And then uh, November 1st, I had my first board buddy meeting with the DVEA. Uh, we use those meetings to just talk about concerns that we have in the school district, uh, some wins, maybe some challenges, and to work on developing that relationship just so that uh, we can better understand each other. That way we can have a better working relationship and try to accomplish that common goal that we all have of trying to be the best that we can be for our kids. So that was so it was good to be able to start that process. And uh, thank you, President Fisher, with the DVA for um, spearheading that and getting that taken care of and lined out for all of us. As Ms. Simichek mentioned, on November 2nd, I met with her over at the uh, Starfish community, which is inside our school district, uh, to learn more about the issue of human trafficking and how it's spreading into neighborhoods that people never would have thought that it would be existing into, you know, or existing in, sorry. And uh, we told her that we thought it would be very beneficial if they had an opportunity to, to try to educate the community and in so doing educate uh, some of the educators that will potentially come across children that have either been trafficked or might be currently victims of trafficking. Uh, the training that she offers, she offers at no charge. 
And she just wants to give awareness to the community so that they can know what to look for so that we can try to help these people get out of that situation. Uh, November 3rd, the New River Fall Roundup. I uh, attended the Leadership and Collaboration Conference on November 4th. I was honored to be a panelist to share my experiences in, as a newly elected board member, so I appreciate that. November 8th, I got to attend the Veterans Day celebration at Terramar, and on the 9th, the Veterans Celebration at Sierra Verde. In closing, I'd just like to say regarding the Veterans Celebrations, there was a lot of concern we had not too long ago regarding Constitution Week from some members in the community and whether or not Deer Valley participated in whether or not we were a patriotic community. And I would tell you that if you ever have a concern about that, just broaden your horizons and open your eyes, participate, go visit these uh, schools when these types of holidays occur, and you will see that uh, they may not necessarily rise to your expectations on one specific occasion, but there are many times when uh, they are by far surpassing anybody's expectations, and these Veterans Day celebrations are one of those Thank you, President Paperman. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Carver. So I would like to say that I attended the Deer Valley Drama Full Production for Alice in Wonderland. It was amazing to watch the students act. I was very impressed. Uh, they were very excited and told me that they spent three months practicing. Uh, also, I... Uh, they were telling me about their costumes, how they got it, and, and the funding that they need to get those costumes. And Deer Valley is a Title I school. Uh, if there's any parents that is willing to support the drama teacher, uh, that will be great. Um, I also attended uh, the football. It was fantastic to see them play. I almost did not go in. Uh, apparently, they don't take cash. So luckily, I was able to find my credit card. Uh, they have a barcode. Uh, oh, I could have used my badge. See, look at that. I could have gone in for free. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so, yeah, so luckily, I found my credit card. I was able to go in, and yeah. Yeah, so then uh, I did ask questions. When I did go to the drama uh, there, they did do a barcode, and also they take uh like, how is the money being documented? Uh, so I'll email Dr. Finch uh, on this. Uh, I know uh, I heard of vendor like Lotus that they'll take all, if it's drama, if it's sports, like everything, and everything is like separated. Uh, you know who, who pay for what. And, but I will email Dr. Finch to, to find that one then. Yeah. I also would like to say uh, I did have a lot of community members and teachers. Uh, they were upset with, uh, with the override. More concern was uh, with what's going to happen to the classroom, where the budget cuts are going to, you know, where are they going to be taking the budget cuts? Are we going to continue having full day kindergarten or half day kindergarten? And, you know, I remember when my kids were very young, I lived in Gilbert, and I had to pay for the other half of the kindergarten for twins, and that was expensive. Uh, and then I know uh, before uh, we went into to the election to vote, I did ask uh, Dr. Finch and Kim Fish was the, on the agenda review, because at that time I did get parents and even teachers that were kind of confused, you know, like, well, you know, you know, if it's taxes or is the money only going to go to the district? And, and I did ask Dr. Finch, uh, would it, you know, can we have, you know, ban an override to educate the public, the staff, you know, for them to better understand? But I believe that Dr. Finch and Kim Fisher said that that would be an issue uh, for the reason that, you know, uh, because this is voting, you know, so we don't want to uh, talk about voting, you know, how you're going to vote, you know, uh, to the public. But I w it's against, yeah, that's what Ms. Fish, it's against the law. But if it wasn't against the law, I would have liked to, to discuss it, you know, because there was a lot of misunderstanding uh, with both parents and teachers. 
Uh, I do want to bring up uh, the importance of funding in, in our education. Uh, if we don't have a strong education, uh, I truly believe that we're not going to have a future in this country. So you know, we need you know funding, you know resources for our kids. We need you know to get them prepared. Like look at the world around us. You know we. You know, we have challenges in the world, you know, and I love, you know, my freedom of speech, you know, and I mean, we do have challenges, you know, even in, in our country, but I do not want to lose my freedom of speech. So I truly believe that through education, funding education is what's going to uh, make sure that this country is going to stay strong and that, you know, our kids are going to be prepared if they need, you know, to you know, fight the world, you know, they'll, you know, they'll be very well educated, you, you know, so, so to me, I truly believe that parents through our country, uh, so, you know, start attending, you know, budget committees, you know, understand how are these budgets allocated, you know, because sometimes I even hear from both teachers and parents, well, the district already has, you know, enough money for this, this and that, but there are rules, you know, like title money, there are rules, like how that money is going to be spent, uh, MNO, you know, like how much is there or, you know, so, so to me, I, I truly believe if parents, if you have a chance, teachers, join the budget committee. Uh, when I was a teacher myself, I didn't understand that. I used to blame, you know, the district, oh, you know, they don't care about teachers, you know, but when I joined the budget committee, I was like, oh my gosh, there's so many buckets. You know, there's so many buckets in a budget. I'm like, well, why can't we pull this, you know, and put it in MNO and, you know, or title money, why can't we put this, you know, to for, you know, teacher salary and student resources, but then there's rules, you know, so if, you know, if we, if we can get educated and just see what, how the process is, you know, we, we can better understand and advocate to make sure that we will continue to have a strong education you know, within Deer Valley, and I pray, you know, a strong education, you know, within our country. I also would like to apologize. Uh, I have uh, community members and staff, uh, they were wondering where I was. Uh, you know, I was not hiding. I was sick with COVID for two weeks, and, you know, and sometimes even before that life happens, you know, you know, in the family and, you know, so, you know, board members, you know, they also have their own you know, issues of health. Uh, so I also keep Mrs. Orway in her prayers. She has her challenges. You know, we all have our challenges. I'm very personal and private. I keep my challenges, you know, to myself. Uh, but if you don't see me here, you know, it's not because I just wanted to take, oh, there's a reason why, you know, if I was not able to make it to a board meeting or, but I did get a lot of messages like, where are you? Uh, you you know you didn't attend this and I'm like well you know I'm, a, I, I'm human I got you know things going on oh I'm sick so but yeah but I would like to apologize I hope you know I did get phone calls that that wasn't real um, and thank you uh, for the presentation to the district and and parents for being here and staff and for the teachers you know standing up for what they believe you know is right. Uh, and have a good evening. And so I'm going to ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.